Hello, welcome to another episode of Forgotten Cemeteries of the Pacific Northwest. I can't emphasize enough how terrible the weather is this time of the year, so sorry for the one video a month type of deal. But today we're visiting Bethel Cemetery, located in Bethel, Oregon, Polk County. Uh, alternative names, just one, McCoy. So let's go meet some local residents and hear their story. All right, a little history about this cemetery, and uh, it's pretty heavily loaded. I'm hoping to find all the people that I want to so I can share the stories with you guys. Old starting point is this one of 1848, with 500 to 2,000 estimated burials per the Oregon Burial Site Guide, so it's pretty old and a pretty big one. Find a grave, however, shows around 900 bur burials, uh, and that's the cemetery history. Only other thing was, in 1993, unfortunately, 118 gravestones were toppled, so there was some pretty heavy vandalism at one time. Bethel was listed as a ghost town located in Plum Valley. Pretty religious background to this town. Uh, a guy named Glenn Owen Burnett named the area. The reason is, he was a preacher in Missouri, and the church was named Bethel. Also. Bethel is Hebrew for House of God, so there you go. Burnett arrived here in 1846, and another famous preacher among the wagon train during this year was our buddy Dr. James McBride, who we talked about before. Coincidentally, we've mentioned the famous Peter Burnett as well, the first governor of California who um, didn't exactly have the best outing in Oregon. I'll, I'll put a book below. You should read about him. It's very interesting. Him and Glenn were brothers. Back to the town, it kind of blew up economy-wise. Had a blacksmith, carpenter, wagon shop, and a general store. Nathaniel Hudson started teaching classes here in 1852. His teaching, um, uh, he named his teaching site Bethel Academy. So some say that uh, Bethel is kind of the first college established in Oregon. Finally, in 1856, the town recognizes, recognized that they needed higher education, so Bethel College was established officially. I read that the college was like 36 by 44 feet and was built for a total of five grand. Um, today, it would be five billion to build a college, if you can think about it. And the Bethel College requirements, you ask, in 1850? Here's a quote. Students applying for admission will be required to have thorough knowledge of English branches, elementary algebra, Caesar, Virgil, and Need, Cicero's Oratations, the Greek Reader, and the Four Gospels. Continuing on with the history, I thought I'd give you guys a different view. A little cloudy and cold today. It sucks. But tuition was $32 for the college. Um, today you can't even buy a college book for that. They even had a female professor, Jemima Nevins, who taught all the girl classes. Um, however, the college would be short-lived as the Civil War hit. Funding was awful, and in 1861, I believe it closed. They would merge Bethel College with Monmouth College. Today, you know it as Western Oregon University, home of the Wolves. From there, things got worse for Bethel. Uh, the railroad scene hits, and um, pretty much spelled zero economy for Bethel at that point. Kind of a sad ending to the area in college. Uh, one graduate of Bethel College named Glenn Holman is quoted as saying, Several years ago, when I came over the hills to Bethel from Spring Valley and saw that old college building had been torn down, I just stopped and let the tears flow. To me, it was sacred building. I was glad that the old hills still stood. Whenever I passed along the road in sight of those hills, I looked at them with worshipful eyes. So, meant a lot to that guy. These days, Bethel is just a church and wineries. So I guess that's what God intended, right? To add, Glenn Burnett moved to California to enjoy the sun and beaches. Said, forget Oregon. Today, we'll stop by the marker of a man lynched in 1887, observe what time does to an individual's headstone born in 1774, hear the story of a preacher who hated his choir singing, learn about the Boise Basin uh, Gold Rush, identify some symbolism, meet a railroad builder, and finally learn exactly what does a moist county mean. You heard that right. Our first stop is that of Catherine Howard Sanders. Um, now I've covered a lot of cemeteries by this point and I can't remember who our earliest birth year is that we covered, but I'm quite positive the new record might belong to Catherine who was born in 1774. Couldn't locate her on my Oregon Trail uh, cheat sheet. Saw Howard's but no Catherine for some reason. Um, she died after the Civil War ended in 1865, and you can see maybe her headstone was one of the ones vandalized back then, because it's in a pretty bad shape, sadly. Alright, let's stop by John Newman Durham's headstone. I think that's how he says his last name. Born in 1820 in Madison County, Kentucky, which is considered a moist county. Yeah, that made me giggle too. Apparently a moist county means a county is between dry and wet. This is quoted from 
Wikipedia, which was the longest explanation ever, the term moist in itself does not have any specific meaning except that the county is neither completely wet nor completely dry. The terms are applicable in the states in which the state legislature has permitted some or all the counties to make its own rule on alcohol sales. A dry county that contains one or more wet cities is typically called moist. So um, now you're educated on that. I'm sure you'll use it in life. Back to John. <laughs> he would leave home when he was 19 and move to Missouri in 1840. Coincidentally, he met a girl named Mary Melvina. What's interesting about John's story, there was some family gospel gossip that he may have traveled to Oregon before his first son was born in 1843, a William Billy Durham. So that would be quite an accomplishment if he came out here. Um, it appears that John was also a captain of Company G of the 5th Regiment Militia of Oregon Territory back then. So a very unique death ending for John and his wife Mary. I guess John was sick and his children notified him that his wife died June 24th, 1889. John responds, well, I guess I'll die in a day or so. Then you can bury us all in one grave and have a funeral for both of us. Um, so 36 hours later, John dies June 26th, two days after his wife. Dude was all trying to be convenient for his family on his deathbed. And in fact, John and Mary are in fact buried in the same grave from my readings. Here's a headstone of Evan Richard Davis. Uh, more of a symbolism stop, but I keep seeing um, anchors on headstones, and I became curious, what does actually does that mean? Uh, at first glance, I thought a sailor, which is true in some cases. However, an anchor can symbolize hope and steadfastness. Masons use it as a symbol for well-grounded hope. Christians use it as a, um, a disguised symbol of the cross, so that was kind of neat to see. I also read it's disguised as a way for secret meeting places. That was a little unclear. I couldn't find much on that. And also, finally, a chain wrapped around the anchor means death, sometimes too early. All right, apologies. It is cold this morning. It's in the 30s. Um, here's the headstone of Elder Amos Harvey. Raised in a Quaker church setting and a pretty popular individual in this area, born in 1799 in uh, Washington County, PA, home of the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Highly exciting. He is credited as establishing the first congregation of the Stone Campbell Movement west of the Rocky Mountains. In a nutshell, basically the movement wanted the unification of all Christians in a single body. Um, also, the use of musical, musical instruments started to make its way into worship during the 1850s. Um, one minister in particular was so appalled by the singing of his congregation that he incorporated instruments into singing lessons. Anyways, Amos gets interested in this movement and starts reading the Christian Baptist scriptures. And the article made it, I read, made it sound like him marrying Jane Ramage got him kicked out of the Quaker movement, apparently, because uh, they were leaning more towards another way of worshiping. The couple would move to Oxbow Prairie, Illinois. In 1845, they would travel the Oregon Trail, and it looks like Amos worked for the famous John McLaughlin from Oregon City for a bit, a.k.a. the guy who was the superintendent for the Hudson Bay Company, so a pretty big deal back then. Eventually, he would end up here in Plum Valley because it seems that Bible-only Christians, as they called them, were well-established in this area. So hence, he started a congregation, and he was the first president of the Fruit Growers Association of Oregon. So a lot of firsts with this guy. And I thought we'd stop by Jane's headstone, who's right next to Amos. Um, she was responsible for making provisions for burying the dead here. She actually donated land for the cemetery use in uh, 1848, from my readings. Hence, we get the visit today, as so we can thank her. Pierce she died at the age of 55, though. I'm not sure why, but was kind of young. Hey, probably one of the more famous stories in the cemetery and would lead you down one of the more horrific events in Polk County history. It belongs to Oscar M. Kelty, so uh, buckle up for this one. This is one of the more crazier stories we've come across. Oscar couldn't find much on his childhood. He was born in 1859, and someone posted this picture of him when he was a boy from um, Find a Grave. They posted it on there. Looks pretty innocent in that picture, but uh, what a story we got here. I did find his mother, Sarah, was an 1845 arrival in New Oregon, and his father being 1852. So Oscar was most likely born right here in Polk County, I'm guessing. His father, John Duffin Kelty, was pretty well known from what I read, and one of the oldest farmers in the area back then, so pretty prominent. In 1884, Oscar would marry Clara Glatton, who we might have missed because she was buried at Pike Cemetery and we visited there, so maybe one day we'll make our way back there. Apparently nobody knew they were even married or together back then. Well, that's until Clara one day showed up at her father's house on a Saturday with children, claiming that Oscar abused her. To be more specific, 
kicked and beat her. There's a mention of Oscar visiting Perrydale, Oregon the following Thursday, uh, which checking Google Maps, it literally looks like a town with an intersection and a church these days. I guess he runs into Harry Glatton, who remembers Claire's maiden name was Glatton, and asks, is Claire home? And the blacksmith goes, yup, not thinking much about it at the time. Nine o'clock at that night, the Glatton family would be woken up by Oscar banging on the door, inquiring about Clara. Where is she? Clara comes to the door and invites him into the parlor holding her baby. We know this is next part because above the parlor is the living quarters of a Mr. Klein, who has just hired help at the time, who was sleeping, but not really. He heard the entire conversation between Clara and Oscar. Kelty goes, will you live with me, Clara? She goes, LOL, no. Oscar gets wound up and says, you won't? Won't you? Two gunshots were fired, followed by a thump. To give you an idea of the layout, I found this article with a cool layout of the house if you're interested. Hearing it, Claire's mother, Permina, I think is how you say it. I think that's, yeah, that's a strange one. Opens the door and sees her dead daughter. Her mother recalls Claire was still clinging to her baby. Oscar would be on his knees holding a 44 caliber Dragoon and then rising the gun at Claire's mother. Apparently it fell from his hands, um, most likely of the shock of murdering his wife. Perina runs to her daughter and Mr. Klein came down, hoping to catch Oscar, but he already fled the scene. Uh, this next part is probably the most uh, sad part of the story. Mr. Klein describes lifting up Claire and hearing her breathe sort of, it was sort of fluttered her breathing like she was still kind of alive. He says he found her with her arms around her baby, with her hands put together, almost like she was praying, and it's likely as she fell to her knees when Oscar pulled out the revolver. The bullet entered the left side of her head, but barely entered the brain, traveled downward towards her chest. The baby's hair was burnt from the gunfire, apparently, and the bullet just missed its head. Oscar apparently did try to turn the gun on himself to shoot himself in the heart, but missed the heart, and it went through his shoulder blade and out the other side. Um, don't worry, he's gonna get his. Town alarm goes off and the search party is formed. They eventually track him down to a barn. They surround the barn, but Oscar escapes again. However, it was easy to follow, all easy to follow him apparently, and they found him at another farm. I guess the crew are quoted as saying, don't worry, it'll be over soon, boys, as they set fires to the, um, the barn. That's key, by the way, the mention of that fire. It's gonna come up again later. However, a sheriff, Thomas J. Graves, or Groves, arrests Oscar and puts him under strict watch. Um, the article spelled the last name differently. However, there is a Thomas J. Graves buried here, so maybe we'll see him during our tour. Anywho, Oscar is found guilty. However, this is the 1800s, baby. Sheriff Graves thinks it's a, it's been a good week. People have cooled down since the murder, and I'm going to put one guard in charge of watching over Oscar. Things were quiet, a little too quiet, like it is now. 2 a.m., two wagons full of men show up in town, 50 men to be exact, driving straight towards the jail. The men began beating down the door and the guard was like apparently scared for his life. These dudes meant business, you knew what they were after. Oscar begs the guard for a knife so he can slit his own throat. The guard obviously refuses. However, Oscar gets a hold of a lamp, breaks it, and starts using the glass to cut away at his throat. The mob would eventually make their way to Oscar, finding him in a terrible state, bleeding pretty bad. But that didn't stop these boys. Oscar Kelty was taken across the street to the court courthouse where some oak trees stood. A rope was thrown over a sturdy limb and um, the end was tied around Oscar's neck. A few strong men hoisted him up and began to hang him. There is a witness to all of this apparently and he mentions that some of the men wore masks. Coincidentally, remember that fire mentioned? There's a small clipping that mentions the Ku Klux Klan being president in Polk County back then. They apparently set fires to barns of uh, those who refused to fire their Chinese employees. A few days after the Oscar Kelty hanging, two Chinese men were also found in a well in Monmouth dead. They believed it was the same individuals who hung Oscar. Uh, there is a mention of a Abraham Blackburn who I thought would who was thought to be the leader of the mob who hung Oscar during this time. And I did find a man displaying that name at a cemetery we visited in the past. The article perfectly lines up with his name, county, and town where he lived during that time. However, zero evidence was found against Blackburn. Apologies, this is the best angle I can get of this headstone because there's a headstone right over here. But this would be of Cyrus Benjamin Holly, born in Fishkill, New York in 1812. 
His family were 1844 Oregon Trail travels, so early arrivals here, and we talked about just how bad travel was in 1844 due to the massive amount of rainfall. Sounds like Oregon during the freaking winter, making the trail miserable along the flooded river crossings. However, he did make it here and later traveled to Idaho in 1862 during the Big Boise Basin Gold Rush, which I don't think we've come across yet. Basically, in 1862, a group of men discovered gold in the Boise Basin along Grimes Creek. Uh, the one thing I notice about these gold rushes, it's like they tell everybody. You think they'd be like, there's nothing here. The influx of miners poured in, and an article said as far as Portland, Oregon people came, which included Cyrus. I guess it was one of the richest and most important discoveries of gold rush during those days. Uh, however, a few years, the population dropped in the area as usual. You know, they farmed it out and got out of there. You will notice on Cyrus's headstone that it says, In Loving Memory, and died in 1863 in Idaho City, Idaho. Looks like Cyrus never made it home, contracting typhoid fever. And I'm, I'm unsure if his body was transported back here. I couldn't, like, verify that. I don't know if this is just a memorial, but a very interesting part of Western history here if you're going to ever visit here and tour around. Way in the back of the cemetery is the headstone of John L. Nutter. Born in 1830 in New Hampshire and a Civil War vet, uh, didn't have the little uh, military service headstone that I expected. He served in the 33rd Illinois Infantry Regiment, Company G, also known as the Teacher's Regiment because there was a plethora of college students in the regiment. Hidden by the road is the headstone of Sarah Wallace Griffin Richardson. Jeez. Born in the great year of 1776 in South Carolina. Now, I'm really not sure when she came, but I'm suspicious of 1847 because her son, Nathaniel Carpenter Richardson, came to Oregon in 1847. We talked about him at Lewis Pioneer Cemetery, I believe. Um, some strange notes on Sarah's husband, George Richardson, says he was last known to be in Columbia in 1824, and from there, poof from history. Here's some of the Richardsons uh, broke off to California, and a George Richard was captured by Comanches in 1847 with two other men, guessing that was a different one than we just discussed. Uh, they did try to escape and were killed, unfortunately. Sadly, I cannot find the headstone of our uh, railroad builder, Wesley Walker Cavanis. Late birth um, date here of 1849, but a pretty important individual of Oregon history. Like I said, the spelling of his last name is weird because his parents have caveness written on their headstone. Well, he has caviness on his. Anyways, he has an 1852 arrival in Oregon, though he was um, only a few years old at the time. Later in life, he became a gold prospector and became interested in irrigation and was successful at it. After that, he became involved in the railroad construction industry and was a good railroad contractor from what the article said. So, a first for us, but eh, you never know, we might find him during the tour. Okay, time for the tour, and it's gotten colder. The sun went up, and it got colder. That doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> Sorry, how whiny is it today? It's so cold out here. This guy, well, like I said, there was a report that from 1993, I think, that headstones got pretty handily, heavily vandalized. This is a cool headstone, though. This is massive, and it's got the little mason symbol in there. But it looks like that one got damaged pretty heavily. I'd say it definitely has a lot of 1770s born individuals here. the oldest birth year you can't see much on there anymore sadly sonic symbols of this one and we got to see that cool anchor one got to see the meaning behind that because I feel like we see it quite a bit can't make that out one of the biggest complaints I saw at the cemetery was the writing's hard to see, which it wasn't too bad today. Let's 
go visit the tallest memorial in the cemetery, who's this popular individual. Juan. I think that's what it says. I don't see much on them. Eh, maybe we'll go this way for a little bit. Once again, we've got the whole cemetery to ourselves. Wouldn't say this one's forgotten. Seems pretty well kept. Unfortunately, it got vandalized back then, but nothing too bad here. Pretty heavily mixed with new burials, old burials, all kind of mixed together. Like the pioneers, you know, we've seen in the past where the pioneers are just like in one area. Here's one that got knocked over, but what the yellow flag means, you know, maybe they're gonna repair it. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of mixed. It's kind of neat to see. Made it hard to find people though. Woodsman of the world. It's neat. to show you uh oh what's his last name i'm trying to remember off the top of my holly in case you didn't get a good look at it before i thought his headstone was very unique and like i said i don't know if he's actually here if it's just a memorial kind of common back then where they just build a little memorial so they can have a place to stop by and somewhat visit the individual. There's that last name Graves, which I'm wondering where that individual is who I think was the same person who was the sheriff back then. It's the Oscar Kelty story. big cemetery so if you're looking to do cemetery exploring this is a pretty good one there's Amos talked about his cool story what's that saying erected by the scholars of the Bethel school district for his benevolence oh that's neat right behind him Famous Oscar Kelty. One of the sadder stories of this cemetery. I think our second hanging story, right? Yeah, we talked about Marple at Lafayette Cemetery. We did not have a marker. Sadly, this one looks like it fell on its face first. We don't know who that is. I did see this a lot, the ones that got busted up. It's like they put it in concrete, sunk it in, and then put it upright again. 
with some very thick slabs. There's the last name McCoy. I wonder if that's something to do with the naming of the town. We might have missed out here on maybe that's the individual that named the town. I don't know. I'll have to look into that because there is a McCoy, Oregon, close to here. There are Civil War vets here as well, but I have yet to see one of the the military style of headstones. And we talked about this individual Nutter who was uh, in the teacher's regiment back then because there were so many teachers in that, <laughs> that one, college boys. But yeah, no military headstone for him. Let's see the uh, interesting twin tower style here, huh? This is neat. Sheldon? Yeah. I don't think we've seen that. That is a pretty cool design. It's graves again. Check this out. It's got, you can take your headstone and then your little flower pot there. <laughs> Whatever it is. Hazelton. Yeah, that's a first for us. That's about a detail on this thing. Wow. Really fancy. I always wondered if those grayish ones. Has something to do with the, the the fashion during that time, if you will. So you see those gray ones, and then we see the old school ones, and then we see those like kind of copper-looking ones. Very neat. Got like that greenish tinge to it. started the stores Sears <laughs> I don't know anywho I think that's kind of the end of the tour this is a, a pretty good one loaded with a ton of history I think you'd really enjoy it if you visited a lot of a lot of detail on the headstones sorry for the lack of videos it is just miserable in Oregon this time of the year. Snow, rain, wet, mud. All the good things that makes Oregon lovely in the winter. Anyways, if you have any other recommendations for cemeteries to visit in Oregon or even Southern Washington, feel free to pipe up below. Hope you're doing good and stay safe out there and hope you enjoyed the incredible stories of this cemetery and the lynching of Oscar Kelty. Have a good one.